Hi everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of the Behold Podcast on the Genre Equality Channel. My name is Hitzer. I'm Isa. Uh, and we're going to do a little something different uh, this week because we have four topics, not three, to talk about. Um, I've actually managed to recommend Isa two topics, uh, two short things, and Isa has <laughs> recommended me a short thing as well. So we're trying to kind of like... Um, Make some of the episodes a little bit meatier, like, like if some of our recommendations are a bit on the shorter side, you know, say I'm recommending a mini series mm-hmm. or a very short, uh, in in this case, a sketch comedy show, you know, let's let's combine those two, uh, and and make it uh, a longer episode, lah. But like uh, the we have kind of a catch, like a rule, yep. like the, the the two combined uh recommendations shouldn't take you more than five hours to to watch and listen to or watch and read or watch and watch, yep. Uh, because you know we don't want it to be too uh, yeah. Too much, too time consuming, lah. Well, we have plenty of stuff to cover uh, as yep. well that we want to cover, and on top of that, like there's other stuff that we need to watch. Uh, of course, during the month yeah. itself. So, so I mean, like we have so much to talk about, lah. So, like I, I, I was actually looking, making a list of of uh, things I wanted to recommend, guys. Uh, so. I got a bit like a bit daunted slash impatient with the list I made <laughs> because I'm like, oh my god! So I was like, okay, if we do things bi-weekly, it's counting it down. I actually divided by you know the the weeks, you know, and it was gonna take like six years to get through my list. It's a very long <laughs> list. Hit. I know, I know. Like, uh, it, it's kind of you know a job has it Like, uh, <laughs> like watching two or three things a month is like not what I do like. Multiply that by a hundred, then that's. Pretty much what yeah, I watch a month. Pretty much. So yeah, so I pick out like the top, you know, like one two percent to uh to recommend. But even still, that's quite a lot. And considering that we just started this podcast, <laughs> and you know, we have like it's not just the things I've been watching recently. I want to talk about things from from years in the past too, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm as I'm sure that I, I said us as well. Uh, so we are free to recommend two things to each other uh, uh, every every episode now. Uh, but for our main topic though. Uh, we'll be talking about Little Women, uh, not just the book and not just Greta Gerwig's adaptation, uh, mm-hmm. which is now available on Netflix and was released earlier this year, at least in Singapore time. I think in America it was in December. Uh, but I would also like to go through kind of its uh, history of adaptations as well. Uh, you know, yep. it's, it's been one of the most frequently adapted liter- literary works uh, out there. Uh, I count about 25 adaptations in total um, and about... Half of them are for the screen, you know, the rest are like plays and, and, and other, other things of the sort. Mm-hmm. Uh, for our smaller recommendations, I've recommended to uh, Isa um, Unorthodox, which is a mini series that debuted earlier this year on Netflix yep. about um, uh, a young woman in Brooklyn uh, of the Hasidic uh, Jewish sect who uh, wants to lead a secular life. So she runs away from her family uh, to. Um, to, to Berlin actually <laughs> um, and then I recommended a very short but um, I don't know what the word is the word is like demented uh, unorthodox uh, also unorthodox uh, but in, in this case like uh, unorthodox sketch comedy show uh, yeah. <laughs> called, uh, called uh, I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson who has one of the strangest uh, senses of humor that oh, I've man. ever seen. Yeah. Uh, so I felt like there was it was it's very different now uh, from like you know Mad TV or SNL. You know, it's it's a bizarre kind of humor, and and uh, it's kind of like my my <laughs> cup of tea personally because it's a very niche thing. Uh, yeah. And you have recommended to me uh, a short novel, or is it is it a novella? It's a, it's a novella. Novel? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, a novella by uh, a sci-fi writer called Alistair Reynolds. It's called Diamond Dogs. Um, I'm vaguely aware of Alistair, Alistair Reynolds, but haven't really read anything of his. Uh, I know his reputation, so this is my first deep dive into kind of his uh, harder-edged uh, sci-fi world, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, So I, it was fascinating to me, and, and it got me really hooked, and I, I kind of want to read more of his stuff. Lah. But uh, let's begin with uh, Little Women. Um, if you aren't aware, uh, Little Women is, is a novel by American author Louisa May Alcott, uh, who, which was originally published in two volumes in 1868. Uh, and then the second second volume, the sequel, uh, 18, in 1869. Uh, so the story kind of follows the lives of uh, four sisters uh, from the March family, the March sisters, uh, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy, mm-hmm. uh, and details their passage from childhood to womanhood. Um, it is kind of loosely based on the lives of uh, of the author and her three sisters. Yeah. Uh, and it is kind of classified as a semi-autobiographical novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, in the novel itself, it's not, uh, it's not a meta thing la. Like 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 Lucy Malscott isn't necessarily a, a character in the book or or proxy. Uh, yeah. But Greta Gerwig sort of like you know um 
extrapolates upon the semi-autobiographical nature of it mm-hmm. to create a more metatextual uh, version of Little Women, which I really, really loved and I considered uh, the best of the adaptations. Mm. Uh, so, like, be- before we begin, right, like, have you have you ever read the, the centuries-old novel at a point and, and have you seen any of the other adaptations? Uh, I, I did read uh, mm. the novel, uh, but that was ages ago. I'm guessing that was, like, maybe in university or maybe even earlier than that. So um, mm. going from memory, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I, I do feel a lot of the adaptations I've seen. And I've only seen two, really. I think the first one I've seen was the Catherine Hepburn one. Because yes, Catherine yeah. Hepburn. <laughs> and of course, this most recent one, which came highly recommended by, by yourself and by a couple of other friends. Mm. Uh, and I really, really did enjoy uh, Greta Gerwig's version of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, a- as you already mentioned, it does the the adaptations don't really follow the novel as closely, uh, as as I think um, some sometimes you expect that from adaptations, right? But uh, yep. with kind of like the artistic freedoms that some of the directors and actors have taken, I do feel like it's it helps to keep with the times, right? Like it's been a long while since the novel has been out, but every kind of adaptation is a product of its time. Uh, and that kind of helps to ground um, the issues and kind of the problems that the characters face uh, in a more relatable way, I feel. I, I, I do agree with that. In, in, in a sense, uh, that is good and bad. Uh, that Little Woman is, is timeless. It has uh, themes of... Um, I mean, it's sad because it's been 150 plus years, right? Yep. Since the novel was released, you mm-hmm. know? And it's, it's themes of uh, women... Uh, basically trying to find autonomy yeah. uh, still isn't uh, isn't at all outdated or mm-hmm. obsolete. Um, in fact, like it, it starts to feel more relevant every time it's updated again and again uh, because the issues are still there, which makes it you know <laughs> uh, hilarious but also very sad because mm-hmm. you know for women's issues you know uh, I I do really enjoy Little Women because I mean for some people have their favorite franchises like, I think some people are like. Um, like you know, like you love the, you have your MCU fans, you have your DCEU <laughs> fans, there's the Star Wars people and the Star Trek people. Uh, Little Women is my franchise. Bizarre for like a thirty plus like your old like guy, right? But Little Women has been my franchise because I enjoyed the book and I enjoyed all the different versions of it. It's uh you know in 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 a way that every every adaptation has a different quite a little different take on Batman, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I love the different takes on Joe and and Amy and and things like that. Like they all they all retain at least the good ones. Like the good adaptations retain the core the core the core issues mm-hmm. and 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 the core themes of the book. But they all have uh, something different to say for different eras. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. off the top of your head, how many versions of Little Women have you consumed over the years? I've watched about a dozen of them. A dozen of them. Damn. Yep. Okay. Yep. And out of these dozen, right, which which are the ones that stand out to you the most and why? Um, the most famous Little Women adaptation is the 1994 version. It, it actually was nominated for three Academy Awards, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and it, it featured an ensemble of powerhouse actresses. In fact, one thing that all adaptations have in common is that it's like the Avengers Assemble yeah. of, of, of female actresses in Hollywood. And the 1994 Little Women version starred uh, Winona Ryder as Joe March, mm-hmm. uh, Christine Dunst as Amy. Uh, so it, Claire, there's Claire Danes as Beth, uh, Susan Sarandon as, as Mami. So it's a very huge, uh, hugely popular cast. Yeah. Um, babyface Christian Bale was Laurie in it. <laughs> Christian Bale, you know, yeah, like uh, Batman, Batman, like gruff guy was Laurie. <laughs> and if you don't know who Laurie is, and if you've only seen the Greta Gerwig movie, Laurie is who Timothy Chalamet played. Mm-hmm. You imagine Christian Bale doing that? Right? Yeah, well, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> this, this was this was this was like about twenty years ago. So like you know, a very young, a much younger Christian Bale, uh, mm-hmm. of course, you know, and and you know like. Uh, actors can grow. Look at Robin Pattinson now. You know this 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 gritty indie actor, and he used to be a sparkling vampire, right? So and things who, change, lah. Yeah, and who's also gonna play Batman? You know, so yes, yeah. Speaking <laughs> of right, so uh, it was it was kind of a who's who of of nineties young actresses. You know, um, uh, I I know that Natalie Natalie Portman, Christina Ricci, Tora Birch, and Alicia Silverstone all uh, auditioned for roles but didn't get any. Yeah, you know? that's so, actually fascinating. I would have thought that. I mean, those three aren't, you know, knockoff actresses by any measure. 
Oh yeah, hundred percent agree lah. So it, it's always like a highly coveted role lah, to play mm. the March Sisters, you know. Um, other than that, you're right. The nineteen nineteen thirty three version is probably the second best I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, the nineteen thirty three version holds the distinct honor of being the first Little Women, uh, quote unquote, talkie. Uh, it's called a talkie because um, at that point. <laughs> Very few talking movies exist. Uh, this was uh, coming off the heart of the era of the silent films in the 20s. Yeah. Uh, in the early uh, 1910s and 1920s. Uh, then talkie movies started coming into prominence. Uh, and this was one of the first talkie movies. And, and, and Little Women was one of the first. Uh, it starred Catherine Hepburn. Uh, it was directed by George uh, Cukor. Uh, enormously popular with critics and, and at the box office. Another, an, another smash, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was also a film truly... Of its moment, you know, because at the 1930s, if you don't know, in America, was the, during the Great Depression. Yep. Uh, so it resonated with audiences in its portrayal of simplicity, uh, frugality, uh, resi- resilience of spirit. Um, Little Women kind of takes place during the Civil War, mm. uh, which is also a, another tumultuous era in in. America la. so there were a lot of poor people then as well la. in in fact one of the key themes of uh little women is is growing up in poverty you know um how you know it kind of uh, with Greta Gerwig's version it doesn't feel it, like you know that they're poor yeah but it doesn't it doesn't feel poor because they have such warmth in in you mm-hmm. know in their in their homes la. so yeah that's why that's what I liked about all the adaptations la. but you know there have been so many others speaking of silent films there have been lots of silent films adaptation there were there were two there was one in 1917 there's one in 1918 uh there have been several feature films there has been uh, an anime version uh could you believe you know in, yeah. in Japan <laughs> Uh, the series was called Waka, uh, Waka Kuasa, uh, no Yon Shimai, uh, translated as Four Sisters uh, of Young Grass. Uh, of Young Grass, it was uh, it's it's a 1980 animated Japanese TV special that kind of ran for 26 episodes. Wow! Uh, and then it had a sequel series. Uh, it's called uh, Love Steel of Young Grass, which was uh, loosely adapted for of uh, of Alcott's book, particularly the sequel book uh, in the, nine, the 1889 version. Oh, right. uh, and it, it kind of ran on uh, HBO also. Um, in, in America, it was retitled Tales of Little Women, so it feels like a bit like a spin-off. Hmm. Um, and it, if you want to watch it, it's actually available on Amazon Prime right now. Yeah. Oh, uh, interesting. Okay. You can catch that as well. Uh, there's been loads of TV mini mini series. I think the BBC adaptation is probably the most famous one. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in the man, I can't really remember in the early 2000s or late uh late 90s. Um, there's there's been a Broadway play. There's been a a ballet on stage. There's been a uh, ballet. The ballet in 1967. Okay. Uh, in 1990, 1998, there was uh, an opera. Uh, there was a Broadway play again in 2005. You know, um, so several different versions, uh, altogether amounting to uh, lots and lots of uh, <laughs> lots and lots of uh, different versions of Little Women. Uh, um, it's fascinating that this has remained as timeless as it is. Uh, why do you think that? Why do you think that is, Isa? I mean, like it. Uh, we kind of touched upon it. A little while ago, right? I think yep. thematically there are a lot of um, universal kind of struggles that that uh, you know are kind of a, a, you know women struggle you know with the home and like being independent and all of that. Mm-hmm. Again, as you said, you know it's sad that to this day, to two thousand and nineteen, we've got the yep. Goex version. Like it's still something that they have to grapple with. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think that it's because uh, and uh, one reason why it's such the March sisters are such coveted roles is because they are written in such a way that they're such compelling characters, yes. right? All with their own points of view and all with their own kind of like quirks and 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 nuances that uh, is a gold mine for a uh, for an actress to mine. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that um, just the source material itself, right, allows for it to be interpreted and to be extended over many different kind of mediums. Uh, mm. And it speaks to a lot of people just because of the way that it's written. Like It may be set in a particular time, right? And to that effect, it is a period piece. Uh, yeah. And in, do, have we ever gotten a, a modern version of it? Of Little Women? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, there was. There was... Um... Man, I, I kind of forgot which one it was, but uh, there was one set in in twi- in the twenty first century. It was a mini series on, I believe it's the BBC, ah. uh, and it wasn't very well received actually. Yeah, so I mean, like, def- I think some things have changed. Maybe it doesn't translate as well, mm-hmm. 
you know, but it's still the way that it's framed and just like the plethora of ways that people have presented it, um, yep. I, I think speaks to the quality of the source material. Now, personally, I remember not enjoying the original novel that much, mm-hmm. but it also could have been like kind of like the, the context of, of when I read it, right? Like uh, the writing style didn't particularly appeal to me, uh, you know, and like at that point in time in my life, like these things weren't as interesting as they are, are to me now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I do feel like it, without the the strength of the novel itself, right, you wouldn't be able to kind of like branch out and have so many different versions of which many of them have been extremely successful in their time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, outside of that, like, uh, it's just a, an amazing story of interpersonal relationship and conflict, right? That mm. uh, I think anybody who has family right will immediately be kind of drawn to it and if you have a lot of women in your life your your mothers your sisters and all of that uh that immediately becomes very very relatable and they do play a lot on that i think especially for Greta Gerwig's version 100 percent agree um to to backtrack also the, it was the 2018 version uh, i just looked it up uh-huh. uh that was set in the 21st century uh in in modern times so that's the bbc uh, one no, no, uh, it wasn't on the BBC. It was, uh, it was a film, um, a made-for-TV movie. Like. I'm, I'm not quite sure what uh, channel it aired on. Oh, right. Uh, but the issue isn't so much that, like, it, wa- it wasn't bad because it was set in modern times. It was just yeah. bad because it was bad. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's yeah. Like, So, it's it just kind of like tangentially, right? If we extend yeah. that thought, do you think if an updated kind of modern version of Little Woman were mm-hmm. to be made, I don't know how often are they making it now. Five years from now, maybe. Let's say hmm. right. So it's about t- as as often as a Batman adaptation, which is very often now. Yeah, but Little Women is doing much better <laughs> in terms of just like critical True. acclaim than Batman movies have been in uh, recent years. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah. say in five years, right? They were to do a modern take. Do you feel like a lot of liberties would need to be taken from the original story outside of the time? I mean, like the era mm-hmm. itself. Like, do you feel like that that's going to change? Will we still see Joe being essentially Joe in the 21st century? Um, yes, I think you, you can still do it. Uh, you can keep the character dynamics the same while updating the setting. Mm-hmm. I think that that's fine. Uh, a lot of Little Women fans are sort of purists. You, yeah. know, uh, you do want the... Taking aside all the very smart themes and, and everything, you you do kind of want the really nice uh, period costumes and oh, uh, yeah. the lovely letter readings and 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 things like that, lah. Of the yeah, sort, like, I'm guessing know, the, the, the notes. Of, 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 yeah, the notes. The exactly. notes wouldn't translate as well over text, I guess. Correct. Yeah, but it sure. can be done, and I'm waiting for someone to maybe give it a proper try, lah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, I, I'm I'm not saying it can't be done, but maybe. I think it actually should be, should be done because I think Greta Gerwig's uh, adaptation of the original set in, in the original time period was probably the most radical interpretation of it. And, I agree. And mm-hmm. it's kind of taken it to the to the max like, in terms of uh, out, outside-the-box thinking for yeah. that time period. Yeah. So maybe you can you can update it. Uh, and, and like we were saying, like we keep repeating, like the, the themes are still relevant. Uh, there's no reason why it, would, it wouldn't feel as, as current today mm-hmm. as it was in the 1800s. So, yeah. Uh yeah, why not la? Um, I I think also like you know kind of it's it's presentation of um, kind of non traditional womanhood like uh, each of mm. little women kind of represent different kinds of women right yeah uh so it it is sort of a, like a literate literature for 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 self actualization you know mm. like it can be any of the four different little women uh yeah uh, you know so it's you're not you don't have to be a domestic uh, person, you don't have to be the housewife, you don't have to be the career woman, you know, uh, you don't have to be the musician or, 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 or more of the artistic, you know, uh, inclined woman, you know, you can be all, you can be different or you can be a mix of all those things. You know? Yeah. Uh, I think it was, it was very interesting uh, portrayal uh, uh, and especially within the 1800s, you know, there's this construct of uh, all female novels needs to have a sense of domestic domesticity, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. like women uh, belong at home, women belong in the kitchen, you know. Um, little women sort of function within that kind of genre, uh, while so- while simultaneously kind of rebuking that that it's all uh, a woman can do. Yeah. Uh, and and it appeals to women uh, of different classes as well, uh, and and of different national backgrounds, you know, because I think. The the it, it translates across cultures and across generations, you know. Um, I, I think at the time uh, in the eighteen hundreds, especially you know, young girls perceived that uh, marriage was their was their end goal, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
um, tellingly, like after the publication of the of the first volume, in what I can only describe as like the first one of the first instances of 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 fandom, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, many girls actually wrote to Elcott and and her publisher asking, uh, who will the will the little women marry? You know. Yeah. So initially, uh, Louisa Mill, uh, Alcott did not want um, Joe. The, uh, Joe specifically, and, and actually yeah. the, the rest of them uh, to uh, to to get married or at least not reveal the ultimate feats yeah. of, of what happened. Like. So it's more of an ambiguous ending. Like. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because of the fan mail, literally because <laughs> of the fan mail, right? She ended up making a sequel, um, which revealed that yeah, they did get married, and then the, the, which is why kind of the sequel book is less popular than the original book. You know? Yeah, because you're gonna disappoint shippers either way, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, like so. This like upon reading kind of the history of the two women, which I was familiar with, and re kind of rereading it for the for this podcast, right? It was fascinating to see kind of a uh, fandom in the eighteen hundreds, like you know, and, yeah. and fan and and because of the fandom, the fan service that arrived, you know, yeah. Uh, Little Women two, the volume two, uh, is like the is is the is the Elcott cut of of the eighteen hundreds. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the Snyder cut. Like. Oh man! So yeah. while the first like kind of subverted uh, adolescent romantic ideals, the second sort of fed into them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was it was a bit less um, less beloved la. Not 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 to say it was a bad novel by any stretch of the imagination, but volume one was always considered to be the better version. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, I have not read volume two in in a long time, man. So uh, in I fact, I think I read volume two actually. See, I mean, like nobody seems to be that interested in volume two because it's just a, uh, it's just too, yeah, too fan service it, it sounds like one of those OVAs that gets slapped onto a DVD release for anime. Yeah, yeah. You know where exactly. they basically have like uh, the bathhouse scene and the beach scene, and then like that's kind of it, just to service the fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, um, I've been really taken um by I I just rewatched um Little Women on Netflix. Uh, mm. And I've been really, really taken by Greta Gerwig's vision of it, and like just by the overall performances, uh, yep. by the actresses involved. I mean, yep. especially as a Sharonan is continues to be one of my favorite. Mm. Is she still considered a star? I would think so. Um, yeah. But but she's kind of made it big, right? I, she hasn't done anything wrong yet, like mm. at all, you know. And her version of Joe is so. Uh, it, it's fiery and it's passionate and it is measured at the same time and just like great kind of all-round performance from her uh, mm-hmm. there. But at the same time, and I think in particular, I want to talk about a bit about Beth, right? Mm. So Beth, I feel, has always kind of been left out mm. uh, as, as just kind of... Uh, uh, you know, because she falls sick and all of that, right? And obviously, no spoilers here. If you she's guys a plot are, device. Yeah, she's a plot device by and large. But I do feel like what Greta Gerwig and uh, Eliza Scanlon, who plays Beth in this 2019 version, they've mm-hmm. done a really good job to making her a bit more of a actual character than a plot device, mm-hmm. right? She's not like the, oh, you know, here's the reason everybody's got to come home and then that's where the, all the conflict and the drama goes on, right? Like, there's a bit more meat to her there. Uh, mm. than in any other version that I, that I have encountered, right? Like, even in the book itself, I do feel like she's kind of played off as this, the, you know, the youngest one, and tragedy befalls and all of that. Like, a very mm-hmm. kind of, uh, like, a, a bit of a fridging kind of incident, right? Like, just to move the whole story forward and get all our protagonists in their place going to be. Yeah. Um, yeah, Florence Pugh is a joy to watch as mm-hmm. uh, as Amy March as well, and of course we've got La- Laura Dern and we've got Meryl Streep, no, no, no. and you can't complain about that pedigree. Um, I th- do feel like uh, Sh- Charlotte May does his job as as Laurie, mm. by and large. It feels a tad too rakish for my liking. Mm. Uh, but I mean, like just to see a lot of these really young stars, um, and and some veterans here as well. Um, kind of like blossom into their own interpretations of these very well loved characters under Greta Gerwig is a joy to watch. You yeah, know? And, yeah. And uh, that, and of course, um, got to mention the soundtrack, which is done by one of my favorite composers, Alexandre Despa. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like so fitting, so good. You know, it's a it's a visual treat, and you know, you enjoy good acting and good kind of like character development it's a very well told story it surprised me I think the first time I watched it in mm-hmm. cinemas after your recommendation 
yep. a couple of months ago just because I didn't expect that much out of it, right? And I was pleasantly surprised and very taken by just this most recent version. Yes, yeah, 100%. I mean, um, like you mentioned the cast and, and everything. Um, I thought like uh, Timothy Chalamet was interesting uh, in the way that Greta Gerwig tried to portray Laurie. Um, mm-hmm. he, she casted Chalamet as a parody of Chalamet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, which, which I thought, that's when I figured out that Timothy Chalamet was like super perfect for what Greta Gerwig had in mind uh, because she wanted to portray Laurie as sort of a, more comedy than a romantic foil. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, I mean, like, like when Timothy Chalamet does have to deliver the emotional beats, he does. You know, he's a very capable actor, as we have seen in several roles before, and we will see in Dune coming up. Like, mm-hmm. like Timothy Chalamet is a totally, like, capable actor. I like, know this on his yeah, part. Yeah, like. absolutely. But in this case, it's, it's kind of a parody of the image that fans have of Timothy Chalamet. Yeah. Like, the, you know, the, the, the bratty, handsome <laughs> young boy, you know, um, which I thought was amazing. Like, amazing. Like. Um, they, if, I, I know this is Behold and we were supposed to talk about like the good parts of it. I do have to like kind of briefly mention uh, the weak point of the cast is, is clearly Emma Watson. Uh, like if, if you... Oh my god. Yeah, I was trying to avoid that. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I was <laughs> listing almost everyone. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Emma Watson as Meg, right? Yep. Is it her fault? Uh, okay, no. that's 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 too. That might be taking a bit too much. Like, because the Meg character is has always kind of been, kind of meh, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, from the beginning, like she's pretty. It's, it's pretty clean cut. You know, like exactly where she's gonna head. You know how she's gonna end up. You know what she's like. You know, we have we have people in our lives who are like that, yeah. right? Uh, but is it just because everyone else is so stellar mm. that it makes her look very plain in comparison? Uh, I agree. Uh, Emma Watson has always been um, an okay actor. Yeah. Uh, I think she does the best that she could here. Uh, and I want to make it clear that Emma Watson <clears throat> doesn't do a, a terrible job. No, no, not like, at all. She doesn't do a bad job at all. She is she is the Lynn manuel Miranda of Hamilton <laughs> in, in, in the sense that she does an okay performance, but not at the caliber of singing or rapping or yeah. acting as the as the surrounding cast, you know. In the same way that Lynn manuel was surrounded by Leslie Odom Jr. and David Dick, so Lynn manuel looked ordinary in comparison, you know. Mm, yeah. Uh, as as a performer, I'm not saying as a writer or anything, or a songwriter, yeah. as a performer. Uh, similarly, Emma Watson, you know, when you we put her next to greatness, like pure, like modern, future Oscar winner, Saoirse, yeah. Saoirse Ronan. Same thing with Florence Pugh, the only person who can probably match her in terms of this generation's Absolutely. female, I female agree. actresses, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eliza Scanlon, who I don't know if you've ever seen HBO's uh, Sharp Objects. I love Sharp well. Objects. We should talk about Sharp Objects one of these days, actually. One of these days, yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah. So Eliza Scanlon sort of broke out from there yep. uh, and then got the role here. So she is a very, very good actress. Uh, and and no need to say that Mer- Meryl Streep and Laura Dern are good actresses. Now. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, yeah. They, they, they have like half a century resume to back them up on that, lah. So like, our praise. Wouldn't yeah, I, I think yet. it's amazing whenever whenever Dern or Streep are in a scene with one of the younger actresses, right? Like mm-hmm. they still dominate. Absolutely, like they fill the screen, right? And even yep. as good as Shasha is, right? As as good as Florence is, like. Wow, <laughs> you know, there is there is something to be said about the sheer amount of experience that they bring to the table in terms of and and, and kind of the caliber of acting that they have. Yes, yeah, yeah, clearly, and 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 the ensemble performance just uh basically elevates what is already a really really great film uh on on in terms of you know uh, just simple things like cinematography, uh, writing. Uh, music, as you mentioned, you know, uh, those were already really solid, la. And yep. then you know, the, the acting amazingly is kind of just the the gravy on, on an already really great meal, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I really do want to talk about though is yes. kind of the clever clever twists of this film. Uh, there are two clever twists on it. Um, uh-huh. Uh, firstly, is that uh Greta Gerwig kind of puts Alcott, uh, Sanya, and Sadasites in conversation with each other. By, yeah. by making this a non-linear film. Um, every single other adaptation has been a linear film. It goes from past to present, basically. Yeah. Past to the future. But in here, uh, the action cuts between uh, kind of the whimsical larks and their more uh, sober parallels in the future. So in the past, it, there was this very warm, yellowy, orangey hue to it, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And also, you know, the more liveliness of uh, of the family dynamics and, and the sisters bickering back and forth. So it makes you feel like a home... Uh, 
you know, like very warm and, yeah. and, and whimsical. Yeah. Uh, and then like, you know, in the future, um, post something that happens to one of the sisters, it is a, it's a more sober, um, a, a sadder la, thing. La. So yeah. it, it, like Little Woman was more of a tragedy. Uh, whereas like the this movie kind of parallels uh, intercuts between the happiness and the tragedy, which kind of, I, I wasn't sure how it would work and it could have easily have been a, a messy narrative uh, conceit. Yeah, agree. But it pulls it off well because it underscores the emotionality of the of the sad parts and the happy parts by by framing them side by side. You know, yeah. look how things were, look how things are. Uh, you know, like things like you know, like the teenage Joe dancing outside the house with uh, you know, outside the dance. You know, with yeah. Laura, with Laurie after meeting at a party. You know, it just seems like very very vibrant and you cut to something sad. Um, there is a parallel between. Two scenes involving stairs uh, mm-hmm. of Joe climbing downstairs, yep. which is just amazing. It's it's a uh, it's a masterpiece of editing. It's uh, in in terms yeah. of uh, um, a lot of people like to edit, you know, uh, according to like flow, but this one is edited according edited according to uh, an emotional beat. Uh, I I think it was it was very very well done. Um, for book readers who know how the story progresses, uh, the connections that Gerwig draws provide uh, a fascinating perspective. Uh, and mm. for newcomers, it's not choppy in, it's not too choppy that you can't discover what the story is along the way like, it's, it's easy to follow yep absolutely absolutely yeah and and, and you mentioned Lady Bird you know like much as in Lady Bird like Gerwig excels as, at portraying kind of spirit and energy of a bustling home mm-hmm. you know in which family tensions can cross from fraught to exuberant and, and back again in, in, in mere seconds you know? uh, there's the creative Joe the willful Amy um, and uh, the, the the doting big sister Mac played by Emma Watson you mentioned the introverted Beth uh, matriarch mommy which is uh, Laura Dern uh, and Dan's performance is really, really good as well. Like, uh, mm. she had two really great performances that year in uh, in Marriage Story and in uh, yes, in, in Little Women. Yes, know? yes. So very great as well. Um, small cameo from uh, Saul Goodman himself. But <laughs> yeah. I uh, I burst out laughing the first time I watched it in cinema. Yeah, uh, Odin Cook plays uh plays uh, the the father figure. Uh, yeah. who is a, a a soldier serving in the Union Army during the Civil War. Uh, and he basically comes in just to deliver the titular line. Uh, <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a thing. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the entire ensemble is, is, is terrific. La. But I think more, even more so than, than uh, Saoirse Ronan, who had a lot of stunning... Um, there were like scenes designed to get her an Oh, yes. You know? Yes, yes, yes. You Absolutely. Know? Like, There's yeah. a particular climactic scene where she has a long monologue mm-hmm. that is just de- designed to be played as a, not, uh, as a clip like, at the Oscars. You know? Yep. Uh, <laughs> and it was so powerfully moving. It's great. But I think like the standout is actually uh, Pew's, uh, Florence Pugh mm-hmm. uh, as, as Amy, uh, who is... Uh, okay, so this is kind of the, the main thing I want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, Amy March, who is, for all intents and purposes, the most hated character of the Little Women uh, franchise, yes, uh, has been portrayed as the villain in twenty plus adaptations and in the and in the book itself. Yep. She is uh, she is presented as an obstacle, as a brat. Uh, she is presented as a, not a good person, la. Basically, basically the antagonist mm-hmm. of, of of the book uh, of the story. You know, what Greta Gerwig and Florence Pugh managed to pull off with this version of Amy, though, sort of. This is the first time that we've ever fully sympathized with Amy. Yes. That we know where she's coming from, uh, where she isn't portrayed like a villain, but rather an equal mm-hmm. uh, and opposite uh, counterpoint to Joe March's point of view. Like, you know, yep. Joe March, the career woman, Joe March, the writer. Um, Amy has a more pragmatic view on the economics yes. of, of, of being a woman at the time. Mm-hmm. And that's why she makes the decisions that she makes. Like, you know, it makes her feel more tragic. It makes her feel more understood, more fleshed out. Mm. Uh, and, and what, what do you think about like this particular new version of Amy that has kind of tra- transformed her from the antagonist to a co-lead? Having such a nuanced interpretation of Amy, right? Yeah. And I do, I do kind of recall um, watching a couple of interviews with Florence where she was just talking about that. Like she struggled with the idea of accepting the role initially because Amy March is Amy March. Right, and it comes with a lot of baggage from all the years, right, uh, of this story kind of existing. Um, but like it, without the the focus, that, okay, the portions of the story where we get to focus on Amy and see Amy's kind of point of view, right, as far as it's possible to see her point of view, uh, a lot are filled a lot more uh, 
with things that we we don't find in the book or in any other kind of uh, version of this. You know, mm-hmm. like just her thought process and just the way in which she explains her decisions uh, mm-hmm. and seeing her makes those decisions in a very clear-minded way. You know, mm-hmm. like it it is shown and it is explained in a way that doesn't just dismiss it as like Joe is the is the hero of this and anything else that is done contrary to what Joe does is is wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it has become like being Amy is acceptable now. Yep. You know, like I've had certain conversations with some of my friends where they are just like, "Oh yeah, I identify a bit more with Joe. I identify a bit more uh, with with Meg." Um, mm-hmm. You know, and I don't think I've ever ever heard someone say like, "You know, yeah, uh, Amy's my girl," right? Uh, but in this particular case, I I think for the first time, like she's come, she's brought something to the table. Like both Florence and and Greta Gerwig have brought something to the table where Amy feels human. Mm-hmm. And 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 not some caricature, you know. Um, much like what Scanlan has done with Beth, like we have a, an actual group of sisters here, where um, the focus is pretty balanced. At the end of the day, we do see more of Joe's story than anything else, but like it's a lot more balanced than it used to be. And mm-hmm. like you can relate to all of the characters uh, in their own way, you know. And I think that in and of itself is is a, a, a triumph, right? To take some mm-hmm. some. A character that has been so kind of like derided, derided over the years, right, yep. and turn it into in into something. I think even like hardcore Little Women fans uh, mm-hmm. will have found surprising. You can't deny the the performance that that Florence has put up, you know, um, mm. and and her interpretation of the character. Yeah, agreed. Like Gerwig's interpretation of the character and Florence Pugh's interpretation of the character is is valid because it is not out of character for for Amy. Like yes. Amy is portrayed as Amy is, you know. Yeah. Like she is she is still coddled and spoiled and bratty and everything. La. And mm-hmm. and Florence Pugh the difference is that Florence Pugh is able to take those elements and somehow kind of make it charming. Uh it is it's kind of the innate charm of Florence Pugh that kind of makes uh Amy palatable at first. Yeah. Before before she ever kind of talks about, you know, being a pragmatic realist, you know, uh, in that world, uh, a woman who is, uh, what it is to be a woman at a societal disadvantage, mm. you know, and, and uh, why, before she even explains to Laurie, like, the motivations behind her behavior, uh, behind her worldview, uh, which in turn, in turn also explains it to the audience, you know, um, really, mm. really love uh, um both both the writing and the performance here like, by by Florence Pugh, I yeah. think it is it is pretty much the the triumph of the film in in mm. redeeming in redeeming Amy, yep. uh, and in making her somewhat of a a co hero like, uh, the 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 a co lead like, in, in in a sense mm. yeah. in, to the, in the film like. uh, amazing. Uh, another thing I did want to talk about also uh, to to end up is uh, to end it off like, is is kind of Gerwig's decision uh, to integrate more of Joe March's life as a writer into the film. Yeah. Uh, serving as kind of an impressive meta commentary on Alcott's own experience mm-hmm. trying to publish the old women. Yeah. You know, uh, well, did did you think that uh this this little twist, this meta textual thing, worked uh as a narrative device, or do you think it felt a bit uh silly? I I don't think it felt forced actually. Yeah. Like I, I it's very clear that uh, uh Gowick is a huge fan, right? Mm-hmm. And she wanted to. I mean, just the very way in which Joe is played, right? Like, with the inclusion of her, like, you know, going to the publishers and, you know, just ending off the way she ends off her story, which kind of mirrors what Elcott did in real life. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I feel like it, it pays tribute to the author's like, own struggle, right? And, and mm-hmm. pays tribute to the fact that, although not autobiographical in any sense, right, mm-hmm. it, there are elements there that, that need to be kind of acknowledged, right? Like... Uh, uh, within Joe's character, there is a part of Al- Alcott's story there. Uh, yeah. I don't think it felt forced at all, uh, or silly for that matter. Um, I do feel that in comparison to some of the other versions, like it felt fresher to mm-hmm. have that kind of like it's it's not it's not they don't she doesn't beat you over the head with it, mm-hmm. you know. It's it's kind of like a very kind of subtle tweak to the way that it, uh, to to the emphasis and I, I really kind of enjoyed that a lot more just because it's a it's a, it's a very nice nod you know mm-hmm. uh to, to Alcott's life uh what about you yeah dude like, like I loved it this was the this was the key element yep out, outside of you know Amy's uh, portrayal mm-hmm. this was the key element that made it the most special little woman adaptation I've seen so far mm. um sometimes I wonder why 
some things are adapted so often or why some certain films are remade so often. Like, yep. why do the same thing over and over again? What I look for in adaptations or in remakes is radical reinterpretations and, uh-huh. and, and, and kind of a different angle to it. Like, you yep. know, what's the point of seeing the exact same story over and over again? Mm-hmm. And this, this was the, the differentiating factor here, you know. Um, I think, like, it doesn't challenge our court storytelling. Nope. Instead, the, the, the movie's structural changes illuminate the completeness of each character's arc. Uh, Gerwig is, re- uh, is revealing the strength of Elcott's work, um, a point that she underscores with the framing device of uh, Joe's literary efforts and with the non-linear uh, narrative device as well. Uh, like, her, like the author, the character is fighting to pursue a creative career in a time when uh, women's stories were largely judged as inferior. Yep. So all, all of this builds to a, a rather daring ending, which uh, Gerwig... Uh, kind of beautifully preserves the novel's final twist, uh-huh. you know, which which wrap up everything neatly. Yep. Uh, but also give us alternative endings, as Alcott's editors slightly demanded, yep. uh, while also casting a skeptical eye at the tidiness of the ending. So yeah. it really has its cake and eats it too. Uh, um, and and, yeah. and works in it works in all directions. Yeah, yeah. It it is it's a very neat way to do it. Like yeah. I don't know how long she must have spent like just trying to find a a, a neat way to kind of like have all those things at mm-hmm. the same time. And I mean, she did exceptionally well at it. I love it. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, amazing. You know, uh, you do have to point out like, you know, everything everything about this adaptation feels different from the writing to the way that the women are portrayed uh, or, or the portrayals of the women yep. uh, by the actresses. You know, it all feels very contemporary. Mm. Uh, like like uh, Joe and Amy and all, they feel like they could be modern women or they could fit in in modern society. Yeah. Uh, as do the rest of them. La. Like, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of like uh, bustling and jostling and wrestling and they're more hyperactive mm. uh, than I've ever seen any adaptations. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, that, that, I mean, like, there's less, it's less proper, right? Yeah. It's less prim and proper than so many of the other ad- adaptations have chosen to, to portray them as. Yeah, and, not and, stuffy, right? Yeah, I've definitely enjoyed that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I uh, just realized, or oh, I just came across the fact that Emma Stone was supposed to be in in this um, version. Over wow, Emma you mean? Watson. Uh, wow, that would've been yeah, way better. But so Emma Stone, I think, is a bit too old. I think. Yeah, I mean, well, she does. Meg, who's the oldest? Meg's the oldest. Uh, it's, yes. Yes, Meg's the oldest. So yeah. So it was supposed to be Emma Watson. I I just like came across that. Interesting. She got replaced due to scheduling conflicts uh, with the favorite. So that's why Emma Watson was cast. Oh wow. Huh. Well, I mean, like I I have a feeling that the diminished a uh, role that Meg has in the film is down is more down to Emma Watson's meh performance yeah. rather than the writing. I'm sure that Gerwig had a way to accentuate and, and differentiate uh, the four characters from different versions yeah. by, by kind of like eliminating different sides of them here. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think maybe, for, you know, if, you, if I was in the editing room and I needed to cut down like 100 minutes of the, of the film, you know, from the running time, like I would look at Emma Watson's performance first <laughs> and, then, and then cut that out. You yeah. Know? Because, yeah. you know, like, you know, like how do you cut out like a second of Florence Pugh's performance, you know? Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. It, in both timelines, she's highlight highlighting the the subtle ways of uh the subtle shift, uh, you know, from like petulance to intelligence, mm-hmm. but still being petulant. You know? yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's fascinating, like, So you don't cut that out, like you cut out Emma Watson. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, if you haven't seen any of uh adaptations or you haven't read the book, you can go to your local library, <laughs> <laughs> or Kinokonia, or you can order it on Amazon.com. You know. Uh, um. The book is always available. It's a it's a cult. Cl- it's not a cult classic. It's a certified literary uh, classic. Yeah. Um. Of all the films you should watch, I would recommend the uh, the free ones, 19, 1933 Catherine Hepburn version. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 1994 Winona Ryder version, mm-hmm. and the 2019 uh, current version by Greta Gerwig, like, which I think is is the best of them all. Uh, do you have any parting parting thoughts before we move on? Uh, no, no, not really. I I really do feel like anyone who has dismiss Little Women as just one of those um, you know films mm-hmm. uh, should really give it a shot right because it has so many good things going for it and it is quite literally one of the best films to come off from last year easily definitely and I think in, in terms of Singapore timeline because we only got this film this year yeah oh yeah I still I still think it's one of the uh, one of the top five uh, 
movies of, of the year so far. Uh, and it's, I mean, admittedly, like, there hasn't been many movies this year for that obvious reasons. That is true, yeah. But I, I do foresee this staying in my top five for the rest of the year. Lah. Yeah, it's going to be hard to beat. Yeah. But kind of, it's just like, it's, there's so, it's just a basket of great stuff that mm-hmm. you, can't, you can't deny, yeah. Now we are delving into the regularly scheduled part of uh, Behold, where we give each other recommendations. Uh, let's begin with uh, a Netflix miniseries that mm-hmm. they did this year called Unorthodox. It is a German-American uh, drama uh, that is uh, actually the first Netflix series to be uh, spoken primarily in Yiddish, which is interesting. Um, it is inspired by or based on Deborah Feldman's uh, 2012 biography, uh, Unorthodox, The Scandalous Rejection of My Hasidic Roots, which is an autobiography which uh, details uh, how Feldman escaped an arranged marriage at the age of 19 while pregnant with his first child, with her first child, and resettled in Germany. Uh, so the, the basic premise of the, bi- of the autobiography has kind of been uh, adapted into a, this uh, fictional narrative, which mm-hmm. uh, retains a lot of the same details. Uh, yeah. Uh, as the autobiography, it 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 it, it follows a character named named Esty, uh, who is basically Deborah Feldman, uh, a nineteen year old Jewish woman who is uh, living unhappily in an arranged marriage in an ultra orthodox uh, community, a Jewish community in Williamsburg, New York. Um, she runs away to Berlin, where her estranged mother lives, and tries to navigate uh, a secular life, uh, discovering life outside her community and kind of reject, rejecting the beliefs that she grew up with, you know. Uh, her husband uh, and family who learns that she is pregnant uh, travels to Berlin with his cousin uh, by order of their rabbi to try to find her. So uh, that is the basic uh, premise of, of Unorthodox. Um, so I, I think prior to my uh, recommending uh, Unorthodox, do you, do, have you ever like uh, uh, heard of it or, or, or watched it before or like an episode of it? Uh, I think when it came out, it played on one of those trailers, I think. So I book I bookmarked it as, okay, cool. This looks pretty interesting. I'll, I'll get to it when, when there's time. Uh, yeah. So no, I, I did not have any sort of inkling of how good it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and until you said like you know let's let's talk about this you should watch this so mm-hmm. yeah I um, really enjoyed it uh, yeah. it felt a little short uh, it's only it's only what four four, four episodes. episodes in the miniseries about slightly less than an hour each yeah um, yeah I found myself wanting more uh, you know but at the same time like it wraps up really really well at the at the conclusion mm-hmm. uh, in a way that's you know satisfying you know but at the same time like it's it's incredibly fascinating yeah. Um, just to have a peek into uh, a, a culture that I'm completely not uh, familiar with. Most outsiders are not familiar with. It's a very uh, closed-in community. Mm, yeah. So, like, it's it's pretty fascinating. Like, I don't usually watch, like, behind-the-scenes kind of specials, uh, yeah. you know. But, like, once, once I was done with the series and it kind of Netflix just kind of rolled over to the making of, I was just like, I, I need to watch this. I need to kind of, like, get a sense for where they were coming from, why they decided to film the story in the way that it did. You know, and just like uh, it's, it was like I just needed more. You know, mm-hmm. uh, so it, it's fascinating, completely fascinating. Um, how did you stumble o- across this? Uh, just by my my monthly uh required watchings. Like, Unorthodox, <laughs> Unorthodox was uh debuted earlier this year, I think in March or man in February or March earlier this year, uh, the first quarter. Yeah. And I remember just being being super struck by how amazing it was, particularly. Uh, it was anchored by this remarkable performance from I- Israeli actress Shira Haas, who I've mm, never seen before, yes. who, is the, who is the lead in this. Um, Shira Haas was... There are... Okay, like, when the Emmys were, were recently announced, Emmy nominations, yep. for Best Actress in a Limited Series, in, in a miniseries, la, it's weirdly enough, like, actually the most competitive uh, category because it has Shira Haas in it. It mm-hmm. also has Regina King from Watchmen. Yep. It also has uh, Tony Collette from Unbelievable. So, um, th- this is was like, you know, if you've ever listened to the, any of our genre equality stuff, you know that I think Watchmen was the best show last year. Mm-hmm. But... I think Shira Haas has a better performance uh, oh, yeah. as an actress, as a lead. Uh, yeah. 
So like as much as like the general fa- genre fandom wants Regina King to win, I don't think she actually deserves it because I think Shira Haas deserves it. That's mm, how good this performance yes, is. Yes. For me to say that it was better than Regina King's performance in Watchmen because I think her performance as, as Esty uh, is incredible. You know, she encapsulates the intimate saga that's kind of defined by the, the limbo of being trapped between two worlds, right? You know, yep. uh, as the story begins, she kind of slips away from her community in the midst of uh, Sabbath ceremonies. Uh, unbeknownst to her husband, uh, named Yankee, you know, uh, and then, you know, and over the course of four very well-paced hour-long installments, uh, it, it kind of flits between uh, SD's unsteady experiences in this brave new world, you know, discovering the joys and the dangers of the secular world mm-hmm. in Berlin, mm-hmm. and the attempts by Yankee and uh, his boorish cousin uh, Moishe uh, to to track her down. Uh, then there are ample flashbacks to the unhappy marriage, the unhappy marriage that catalyzed the decision. Um, there are a few grand revelations about the nature of that process, but the story develops a, a kind of simmering tension around the stakes at hand. Um, aside from the kindly advances of a, a piano teacher she meets while helping her alcoholic father collect rent, uh, SD has virtually no experiences mm-hmm. in the world beyond her community. As I mentioned, it's a very insular community, you know, uh, and and has inhabits that process like a, like a like a snail slowly emerging from from a very delicate shell you know um at the at the same time also the the film does feel like a mix between an an escape story yeah you know and, and a survival story and a coming of age story uh, yeah. all all at the same time you know so um the, what what do you what do you think about it it's kind of mesh of genres and the the idea that uh of of a woman breaking out of religion uh it... <laughs> Okay, first, first yeah. of all, Shira Haas is amazing. Amazing, yeah. Absolutely yeah. amazing. I mm. think like these moments in time they, they, where you get close-ups of her face and just the the slew of emotions that she can go through in one given scene like that is pretty insane. Uh, and I completely enjoyed that. Um, yep. As for... Um, I, I think... Uh, all the kind of like mishmash of genres that they're kind of going through at the same time. Mm-hmm. A, a part of me, there was a point in which I was just like, oh, okay, right. I I can kind of see where this is going to go. Uh, and I had a feeling that it might be messy, yep. right? Because they're trying to deal with so many things at, at one time. But uh, it played out very, very, fairly well. And like at no point in time did I feel, oh, you know, like they're kind of like crossing lines here. You know, it's not going to be clear. You know, it's, it, on the one hand, there is... Um, the the kind of like melancholic uh beauty of the growing up story having come from like struggling with her, her past and all of that and then the detention of trying to run away and and keep herself free right so that uh there are a lot of these moments that are very well played out and very well um uh edited in such a way like that mm-hmm. the flow of which is never really quite interrupted like it never allows you to kind of sit in the space of that oh now is her escape right and then like oh now you know she's gonna go and grow up like it never allows you to sit too long in any one of those given genres uh and that makes it very compelling you Mm. know uh like this was a very um i wouldn't say it's an easy watch Mm. uh per se just because like it there are some some scenes that that feel very harrowing and and it's just um exemplified by by the performances uh you know, but it is absolutely something that I think if you start on it, you're gonna to want to watch it till the end. Yep. Right. Like it was, it was hard to take a break. It it really really was throughout the slightly less than four hours that that it takes to view the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, this whole story about her kind of like uh, uh, making a decision for herself, right? And and her, the choices that she's made to take an out that that was presented to her that she didn't believe that she wanted. You know, mm. and uh, at the end, I think like faced with a decision uh, that was truly her own at the end, right? Like that, that for me was the combination of the entire the entire show, uh, mm. you know, in the bedroom with, with the husband. Mm. Uh, uh, like, yeah. I agree, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I mean, like, I don't think there are that many things to spoil per se, mm-hmm. but like just the way that it plays out and just like finding, uh, to follow her on her journey to find her feet. To find her voice, both li- um, literary and literally, um, just really uh, so well told, 
right? Mm-hmm. Uh, like, at no point in time do you feel alienated from the character, despite the fact that her circumstances, the actual context in which she lives in, is very yep. alien to most people. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, I, I, I loved it. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, I think the thing about the various genres that I wanted to bring up is that mm-hmm. the reason it works is because it's organic to the character drama. Yeah. Like, it, it's not like, oh, it's not like they came in for plans, like, oh, it is, you know, part escape, part survival, mm-hmm. part coming of age. And, you know, it was just like very organic to the story. La. The yeah. story demanded an escape. So it felt like an escape movie. Yeah. Then the story demanded a coming of age, you know, in terms of her discovering kind of the secular dangers and pleasures. Then that felt coming of age, you know. Mm. Uh, it, it felt like she was on the run because people were running out were chasing after her. Then yeah. that, it's natural to the story la, because that's what their fulfillment mm-hmm. went, went through. And that's what this character of, of, of Esty goes through. It doesn't feel... Uh, like a uh, cinematic dramatization, it yeah. felt more like natural. Like this is what would happen if somebody from that community ran away. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, and I also really loved how it doesn't portray the secular world as as all that. You know, like it doesn't portray it as like oh the safe haven, yeah, the, the beacon of hope. And and similarly, it doesn't portray her kind of insular Hasidic Jewish roots, and it doesn't demonize or villainize it. No. It portrays it its faults, you know, mm-hmm. you know, like the, the, the sexual training from, from older women in the community, the arranged marriage, the, the kind of like uh, oppressive nature of those op- uh, arranged marriages as well because you have to be subservient to the husband, right? You know, yeah. but, but, but Yankee himself, the husband, he doesn't become a patriarchal cartoon, you know, he's not, he's not a monster. He is, no. he's, he's a sensitive young man kind of engineered to operate on the at the whims of uh of their demanding mother so basically he's a product of the environment yeah and and he demonstrates a genuine desire to bond with his wife you know uh mm-hmm. like you know like he tells her different is good or you know or when when she complains that she's not like other girls you know he says difference is good right but her difference is more complex and expensive than anything in his limited world view you know mm-hmm. yeah so it, it's it's very very nuanced thematically and in terms of characterization because you know um, neither side is good or bad it just portrays the reality of like oh, okay this is the reality of a very religious ultra orthodox community and this is the reality of a very liberal very uh very progressive Berlin, la, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's fantastic. Like, you know, the first time she goes to a nightclub, the first time, <laughs> uh, you know, um, and, and, and different things are like, you know, if she's trying to be a musician, you know, those are different aspects of what she wants to be and trying to find herself. Yeah. While at the same time, she keeps being drawn back by by, by her family, la, by, by her culture, by her roots, you know. And, and, and like, you know, what is the cost of your autonomy? You know, what do you give up? Do you give up your family? Do you give up your heritage and culture? Like, what is the, what is the balance in that? And I think the, this mini series kind of tackles that thematic territory very well. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's mentioned a few times, but just kind of in passing, the weird uh irony of a person escaping oppression in yeah. America and leaving to Germany. Uh, it is the the irony in that is something that her family members pointed out because as as you know, the Hasidic Jewish community uh, are primarily descended uh from. Uh, from Poland, from Austria, from Germany, yep. they escaped. They escaped uh, Nazis, uh, Hitler's Germany in the 1940s and uh, in the in the 1930s actually, before Hitler actually rose to power. They escaped, went to Brooklyn, New York, and set up the community there. Mm-hmm. So the idea of something that they have struggled to do, you know, generations past, and some of them are still alive, you know, like the grandmother and all that, you know, the idea that they struggled so far and so hard to find a place for their for their culture, for their religion, for their heritage, and found a safe space for it, yeah, that someone of their community would want to escape that and go to Berlin is so <laughs> it's so insulting to them, and I and I never kind of um understood that point of view before until until I saw that. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was. I I mean, like, when they first kind of mentioned it, right? Like, very early on, you've established the fact that she's going to Berlin. Yeah. You know, and um, every one of her family members, whenever the fact that she fled to Berlin comes up, mm. it is said with such disgust. Yep. But it is never explained, right? Mm. Like, you, you need to kind of, like, draw your own kind of, like, conclusions about just how far out that idea is much less the action of doing so, yeah. right? And um, of course, at the same time, she's also mirroring her her birth mother's uh, 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 actions, right? Because that's what her birth mother did mm-hmm. as well, um, which kind of explains it. So, like, you got you have 
every time they talk about uh, about um, um ST's mother, yeah. right? You know, that kind of vehement kind of like vileness that arises whenever she's mentioned um is is uh so it's very intense you know um and the irony of it is uh, i i don't think they focus too much i mean it is ironic i yeah. I, I do feel but i don't think they focus much on it within the story itself like mm-hmm. it they do touch about you know uh um when when she first gets to Berlin, you know, do you want to go visit this, this war thing, that war thing, right? And uh, that's not at all pertinent to where she is in her life, right? Like, that's not the point that she's there and I, none of her friends kind of understand that at that point in time, yep. you know? But the film, uh, the, the series doesn't actually kind of, like, address that, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's brought up, it says, like, yeah, of all places, right? Why Berlin? Yeah. Uh, but, but it never you know, goes into like the nitty gritty of why that's particularly a problem because time has changed those places, right? Not yeah. not not necessarily to the older generation though, who still sees Berlin as the place of oppression. Yeah. Uh so yeah, so I mean I get the the the, the points of view from, from both sides. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, there is a certain authenticity to where uh ST is coming from and yeah. there's an authenticity to where the older generation is coming from. Because like if you stop to think about how they got to Brooklyn, uh, then you totally understand their their reaction to yep. this, lah. Of course, you know. Um, I I think like it's it's such an amazing transformational character drama mm. that like even if you don't understand the kind of subtler uh political and and cultural themes associated with it in in terms of you know uh, the Jewish community escaping Nazism to to Brooklyn, like even if you don't understand the historical context of that, yeah, like you still be on the edge of your seat, like just by watching as this transformational journey, you know. Yeah, um, I think it's it's a wonderful, one of the best miniseries uh I've seen this year. Shira Hass's performance, absolutely is amazing, incredible, yeah. and and just the immersion into. Uh, Hasidic uh, Jewish uh, or Hasidic uh, Satma Jewish community, mm-hmm. uh, in in terms of the portrayal of their of their uh, rituals, the portrayal of their marriages, the portrayal of uh, you know like for, for it it's actually quite beautiful like you know the the gorgeous spectacle of religious life mm-hmm. you know imbued with sh- centuries of of tradition you know yeah but like. It, there's the beauty of that and it captures that as well but it's also attuned to ST's inability to find her place within it you know yeah. it's, it's it's quite masterful uh. like I, I actually really enjoyed the, the wedding sequence that he had I thought it was oh that was such a good yeah absolutely mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh, brilliant man like uh, I mean uh, any concluding thoughts before before we move on uh, I it, this caught me off guard for sure yeah um I, I think like I I would definitely be looking forward to more of Shira Hass's stuff. Mm. I'm gonna go check out the other films she's she's won stuff for like Broken Mirrors and and mm-hmm. uh, some of the other things that she's she's done. Uh, yeah. Just because like I I didn't had no idea who she was. I didn't know what to expect, and uh, I'm pretty blown away. You know, like she she carries this series on her mm. own quite literally, um, and. Uh, highly recommend this watch like it's it's not a long watch it's probably one of the most educational kind of things that i watched in a while just like it, it broadened my worldview for sure definitely but, yeah yeah so, i mean same thing here like Anna, Anna Fodox is a fantastic coming of age drama mm-hmm. that that doesn't repudiate the world that st comes from no it doesn't. so so mm-hmm. much as it celebrates her ability to create a new one on her own terms you know yeah uh so it's it's a fascinating character drama do catch unorthodox on netflix uh available for streaming at any time and of course if you want to read the book that it's based on is available at all good bookstores. It is called uh, Unorthodox, um, The Scandalous Rejection of My Hasidic Roots. Uh, so yeah, fantastic stuff. Uh, read, read and watch the show. Uh, next up, let's talk about a short little uh, <laughs> um, sketch comedy show. Uh, which uh, When I mean short, as in like each episode is between 10 to 15 minutes. So yeah. it's really, really short. And I think there's only six or four. Four to six episodes. Uh, six, yes. Six episodes, right? Six episodes. So yeah, yeah. Uh, essentially, you can finish it in just about an hour or just above an hour, uh, It's called "I Think You Should Leave" with Tim Robinson. Uh, it is a demented sketch show uh, that is created and written by former SNL writer and the star of one of my favorite sitcoms, uh, Detroitus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it he this is kind of the most. Um, I've been following Tim Robinson for a long time, like his brand of comedy. Yep. Uh, and I've, I really feel like he has always seemed f- frustrated 
by the confines of I guess mainstream comedy uh-huh. or the limitations of sketch comedy. Uh, in in SNL, you know, in SNL is to play to a very broad base. Yeah. Uh, in in his show Detroitus, he you kind of see a glimpse of it. Uh, but I think he really, really, uh, undilutes. This is the most pure, <laughs> the most unfiltered version of his of his mo- of his brand of uncomfortable and outlandish. Uh brand of sketch comedy yeah you know? yeah um it's in, insane I, I think one one word that i love to use to describe it is it's it's uncomfortable and awkward oh and, man yeah and uh tim robbins's brand of comedy is is that like in this uh, and it has a bunch of um amazing sketch sequences that are like downright painful to watch and downright uncomfortable but also like <laughs> Bizarre and surreal and and really funny like it's comedy unlike uh, it's sketch comedy unlike I've I've seen anybody else do you know yeah yeah, yeah. for sure I mean like oh, just today I was texting you about it mm. uh there's downright there's some spots that are just painful to watch like I had to look away right like uh but the it is a spectacle that is it's 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 a train wreck that is hard to watch yeah. to look away from. You know, but at the same time, there are these moments of kind of brilliance, right? And I think what I what I was most taken by is the fact that amidst all this like very awkward, very painful, very uncomfortable v- things that you have to watch, right? There are a lot of very insightful uh, perspectives on the way we communicate. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, and and just like how human la- relationships work, like any one of the sketches that you pick out, right? Like it is just playing on uh it's playing on dynamics that exist that are brought to its illogical conclusions mm-hmm. right and it's very very sharp in that way you know yeah. and the yeah. absurdity and the level of 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 extremity that it's pushed to right mm-hmm. highlights those dynamics and how absurd uh basis those dynamics actually are Mm-hmm. Right, you know, there's a lot of like hedging that's going on, and they're brought to an extreme degree. You know, when people are trying to play play over each other or play up each other and things like that, like it constantly gets pushed, um, so far, right, that you start to realize that what we accept as a normal kind of human uh behavior, right, in our our communication and relationship with with other people, yeah, uh, in public in particular, or or in in public settings in particular. Right, are uh, are not as normal as we would like them to think them to be, right? Because yeah. it, it it takes this kind of like juxtaposition between what we accept as a normal kind of situation and how Tim Robinson like plays it out, right? That it really is <laughs> it, kind of brilliant in its own way, but it's no less painful. Mm. I I do agree. Like um. Part of the reason that I I I love this sketch show is because it's so different from you know SNL or or even stuff that Ricky Gervais or Larry David or Dave Chappelle do yep. Like those are all brilliant sketch comedy shows. Key and Chappelle they're all really brilliant la, But they all come from, I think, understandable points of view in humor. Yeah. Like like not really uh left left field or or, or oddball and. Everything that that Tim Robinson does is is so odd. Uh, <laughs> the, his approach to setups, his approach to punchlines, it's it's almost impossible to predict anything that's going to happen. Uh, yeah. For a, every second of his sketch show, um, like Tim Robinson is is kind of a, a master of em, em, embarrassment. I think the word is you know, mm. uh, everything uh, about every second of this sketch show is filled with embarrassment. Uh. It, it, they tend to focus on two types of characters: uh, people who, who kind of tell small lies that grow larger and more obvious as they refuse to come clean, yep. and people who are too irrational, confused, or stubborn to understand what's happening, or or refuse to understand because they it would require admitting their own ignorance. Uh. Yep. So, like this might sound like typical cringe comedy turf, but Robinson keeps it fresh by extending ideas be uh, behind. All beyond all bounds of logic, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, re- resulting in characters or situations that are so utterly absurd that that you won't even think of comparing them to 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 anything else, you know, because it, it is in- incomparable. Uh, some <laughs> of the situations that he comes up with, you know, um, I mean, with that being said, right, like like what are some what, what do you think are some of the sketches that are most like representative of, oh, of this type of comedy? Um, baby of the year is a favorite. Baby of the year is the, is the best. Baby the of best the year, episode one. Yeah. The episode one, like just starting off with yeah. that, I'm I'm like okay, I totally understand why he loves this. Yeah, uh, I really like that. I really like uh, the episode with Stephen Yuen. 
Yeah, um, yeah. Gift receipt, the gift receipt one. <laughs> oh my god, that one. The shit on the receipt. Oh my god, I I I had. Oh, it was so hard to watch, but at the same time, I was holding my sides. Mm. Um, those two. I thought the hot dog suit, the hot dog car one was pretty funny. Yep. Um. Yeah. And um, what's the one in the the feedback group one? Focus group. Focus group, yeah. So, like, these four kind of stand out in my memory. Yeah. Uh, uh, as being just, like, completely and utterly absurd. I do feel that some of the rest don't land as hard. Mm. Um, you know, uh, but th- these are definitely the standout four. Uh, yes, you're right. It is uh, an inconsistent sketch show, but uh, the thing that makes everything work is the brevity of it. Like, none mm. of the sketches overstay is welcome. None of the episodes feel like a chore to get yep. through, you know? Yep. It's, it's hit and miss, uh, but even the misses are not long enough that you actually care. You know, yeah. It's just like, oh, yeah, okay, that was five yeah. minutes gone, no, whatever lah. Uh, so it's not like you're watching like a, a, a TV show where, you know, like you, there are a couple of seasons that suck and then there are like, you know, 24 episodes or 15 minutes each, you know. Yeah. It's just very like, yeah, okay lah. If that doesn't work, it doesn't work lah. But the ones that land, like land really hard lah. Yep. Um, like, like I mentioned, my, my favorite is Baby of the Year, of course, in, in episode uh, one lah. It's one of the, it's, it's one of the craziest premises for, <laughs> For a sketch uh, comedy bit that I've ever seen, uh, I, I kind of don't want to kind of, I don't want to describe it because I want you to discover, uh, it, yeah. you know, like yeah. but even describing what Baby of the Year is sounds so preposterous that you might not even want to watch it. it it's, it's one of those, like, for us to explain it yeah. would be to explain the joke and it wouldn't work. Correct, you know. yeah. Um, similarly, my second favorite is uh, Focus Group. Mm. Uh, I think Tim Robinson has found a perfect collaborator in this 81-year-old uh, Cuban <laughs> actor named, named Ruben Rabasa, uh, <laughs> who can not only keep up with Robinson's like uh, insane whims, but deliver every line oh as if God. it was his, his last. You know, he 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 plays like basically the weird one in the Focus Group. You know, of uh, of. <laughs> Basically, they're kind of testing for a new car model and he, he suggests things, ridiculous things, you know. And then it kind of abruptly takes a left turn that <laughs> I, di- I, did- I didn't see coming. No, neither. I... Oh. Um, one thing that you didn't mention that is also one of my, a couple of things that, that I loved also is, is the, uh, the Man, which is, uh, it features Will Forte. Mm. It is about uh, basically a man who wants to get revenge on a, on a baby that cried on his flight. Um, from years ago, <laughs> like he has planned like for thirty years to get revenge on this baby, and it's amazing. Uh, there is laser spine specialist in in uh, episode oh, three. Yeah, it begins as a commercial for minimally invasive spine surgery, and it turns into a heated flare up between uh Robinson's uh jilted amateur uh, singer and uh, and a uh, Connor O'Malley song. Shocking scam artist, you know, that's still a commercial. Uh, it's it's pretty insane, like you know. Um, and I forgot what, what it was called, but there was also a really, really good one that you should definitely catch. Uh, it's basically a, a parody of rock and roll biopics, you know. Um, mm. it features a band finishing up a gospel song in a small recording studio in the late 50s, you know. And then a, a dismissive label guy says that they're not interested, they're looking for something new, something teenagers can get excited about. So the front man. Uh, tall, handsome, with a deep baritone drawl, starts making up a song on the fly, you know, with, with Robinson and on bass following along. Uh, they play the first verse of a Johnny Cash s country song about a saloon murderer, and then the label guy is interested, and then Robinson char- Robinson's character launches into like this loud, tuneless, absolutely hilarious second verse full of nonsense lyrics that are still somehow internally consistent <laughs> with each other. It's it's pretty bizarre, man. Uh, yeah, this this yeah. is one of the weirdest sketch comedy shows I've ever it, seen. It is so odd. Uh, okay, so I'm I'm not really sure. I was trying to understand what kept me watching, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think it has to do with the fact that at the end of every episode, I am so glad that it's done because yeah. it was incredibly uncomfortable to watch. And yeah. then at the same time, past the first episode, I'm just like, how bad can this get? <laughs> <laughs> Right, so it just repeats the cycle, uh, right, and it keeps going, and I'm just like, how bad can this actually get? Even though I, I, I'm, I'm so relieved that I, I, I'm done with that sketch, yeah. right, and I, I think that for me is a very weird sort of compulsion, mm-hmm. uh, that I don't think I've experienced that many times in my life, uh, especially when it comes to watching sketch comedy. Yeah. So, uh, it is unique. Uh, it is 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 absolutely unique. Uh, in its own way. Uh, and we are recommending it because, like, 
you might not know that you actually need this in your life. Mm-hmm. It will be painful. It will be yeah. extremely uncomfortable. You will question your sanity and our yeah. recommendation. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, to be very, very honest, I don't think this is for a lot of people. Like I think like Tim Robinson's humor, mm-hmm. right, will not be for the majority of people. Man, uh, he was fired from SNL after one season because his humor was too weird. Yeah. So yeah. we we I think we do need to just just put a clause there that this won't be for everyone, but mm-hmm. it's worth a shot because you don't know if it might do something for you. Yep, yep. Uh, I found this totally by accident. Uh, it was one of those autoplay things on Netflix. Right. And then uh, I was just you know I was having lunch or I, I was eating a meal uh, and then like my show had finished you know and then they just autoplayed uh. I, this, you know, uh, Tim Robinson show. And then I, I was just like, oh, I just sat down. Then I just kept watching until it finished, like, the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> it was bizarre. Like, I found it totally by accident, but I, 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 I love Tim Robinson. I've been following his career for years. Lah. So I, I, I do have to say that, like, he is a very take it or leave it kind of guy. There yep. is no middle ground in his yep. humor. There is no, like, kind of universality. Like, you know, like, he and Peel was a very universal show. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, even if you didn't kind of understand the, the racial connotations of some of the sketches, like, you could you could enjoy it on a pure comedic level. Yeah. Uh, with Tim Robinson, if you are not slightly insane, or you know, is he a, if you're not slightly off kilter yourself, you might not even enjoy it. But yeah. I am slightly off kilter, la. Like, and and I've been so kind of sick of traditional sketch shows that I was kind of dying for something, uh, a breath of fresh air in in the medium. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, something experimental isn't always great, but it is. Uh, it is uh, audacious, lah. I I do have to say, I I really enjoyed the audac- the audacity of the show. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, next up, uh, let's move on to uh Isa's recommendation. It is a short novel, a novella, yep. by a sci-fi writer called Alistair Reynolds. Uh, it's entitled Diamond Dogs. Uh, do you want to give like a small breakdown before we we continue? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Alistair Reynolds is one of my favorite like modern day sci-fi writers, and I've been reading his stuff for years. Yeah. Uh, I I believe I covered um, one of one of the bigger uh, trilogies that he did uh, on pull list on genre some time ago. Mm, yep. So I recommended uh, Diamond Dogs um, to to his just because it's one of the f- it was one of the first uh, pieces of his work that I picked up. Uh, and it was is a fairly short read, and uh, you know I've been talking about Alastair Reynolds for a while now, and just wanted to uh, get his day <laughs> to to you know get on board, right? Uh, and so, ooh, how do we? Hmm. Okay, let me see how I can describe this with with that. So, Diamond Dogs is set in um in the Revelation Space Universe, which is kind of like Alastair Reynolds' kind of his own um sci-fi universe that he uh has created over the course of I think now is close to like twenty five books almost. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's set in the late twenty fifth century. Uh, and mm-hmm. It's a new kind of take. Well, the the book has been out for a while now, so not that new. But it's a new kind of take on uh, the deadly maze premise. Mm. Uh, so think Cube, right? Um, mm. Of which the multiple versions of it. Uh, and, and this time around, um, there, there is a tower, basically, that's filled with deadly puzzles, uh, deadly mathematical puzzles. And uh, our main protagonist, Richard, right, is... Uh, um discovers um discovers that a childhood friend of his uh has who who he thought dead for almost 25 years has reappeared right and he's recruited to joining a team to study this monument this uh tower that floats uh on the moon yep uh and uh inside it's basically a series of rooms that whose entrances get smaller and uh you have to solve a mathematical puzzle in order to proceed up this 250 meter tall tower uh that seems to defy the laws of physics and and all of that uh essentially the entire premise is that uh is about the sacrifices that are made uh to uncover the mystery behind the spire uh or the blood spire as it's called in the book right so they take increasingly risky maneuvers uh, they continually um, experiment on themselves uh, to kind of push the limits in which they can uh, solve the puzzles that are available to them. Yep. Yeah. And um, it, I, that's kind of like a very brief 
way to kind of describe the premise of the story without giving away too much because a lot of it has to do with the actual process in which they go about it and and the conclusion of that itself you know but it speaks to kind of like uh the the whole idea of curiosity killing cat right Mm -hmm. uh and that plays out uh to a very kind of extreme in a very extreme way Mm -hmm. uh so this is your first alastair reynolds kind of uh uh your entryway to alastair reynolds right so what do you think of, of diamond dogs Yes, uh, Alistair Reynolds has a has a harder edge to sci-fi than than I'm used to. That is mm. kind of uh, that's my sci-fi palette, like, personally. Yep. Um, to to kind of just uh, briefly describe to fans, um, uh, medium sci-fi is like Star Trek. Yep. Star Trek is medium sci-fi. There is some emphasis on the science and some emphasis on the social and religious and cultural and anthropological aspects that you know that you can extrapolate from from future science yeah so that's medium sci-fi soft sci-fi is like star wars yeah it's like to an extent dune also because dune more focuses on the religion yeah of it lah you know so uh, it doesn't focus on science at all yes you know or science is a, has a minimal impact it does take place in a futuristic science fiction society mm-hmm. but it doesn't focus on science all too much lah. like you know dune it focuses on on uh basically messiah stories and how and the evil of religion you know uh things like that uh hard sci-fi is if you think if you've seen the film primer if you've uh, read The Martian or watched The Martian, you know, mm. uh, science fiction stories that focus primarily on feasible science or just focus entirely on what science can do, that is hard sci-fi. And Alistair Reynolds is not entirely hard sci-fi, yeah. but it's, it's on, a harder, on a harder spectrum of sci-fi. Yeah. I mean, he has, he, he's an astrophysicist, right? Yep. Uh, and he worked with like uh, the European Space Agency for a long time before he retired to write. So a lot of the stories, and actually it's the harder edge in his books that I really quite enjoy, yep. you know, because yep. that, like, it, it's extremely consistent across all of his work, right? Mm-hmm. Like if he explains a piece of tech in one book and mm-hmm. another book takes place like, 500 years into the future, right? That is going to carry over. You know, he's very, very consistent with his world building and with the Mm -hmm. science behind his world building. And none of which I feel are very far reaching. There's no space magic involved Mm -hmm. in his, in his work. Uh, And, and that appealed to me a great deal, especially when I started reading uh, him like in my early twenties. Yes. Yeah. Um, So to, that's kind of this roundabout way of me saying that like I was um, uh, at first, uh, n- not the whole way, but just like initial impression was I was very uh, I had a hard time getting into his prose style. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's very blocky and linear. It, it's a, almost like a chart, you know. It moves from point to point like bars on a graph, you mm-hmm. know, like like words connecting the dots on a, on a matrix of a story. You know, uh, most scenes are relayed uh, directly in descriptive fashion. Uh, there is there's little poetry or or you know. Uh, Polished like in that in that pro style, and yeah. and it's it's as you mentioned like it's it's because he's not a writer per se, mm-hmm. he's more of a of a scientist and engineer, uh, and an ideas guy la. Yeah. So uh, that is to say that once I got past the the kind of uh, clunky uh writing style, yeah. I, not 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 clunky la, the direct uh, I I think what I want to say is the direct writing style because it's not clunky at all. Yeah. It's just it's just very direct that like it it kind of gets across the ideas a lot easier and a lot quicker mm-hmm. uh, i feel then like you know then like say a more poetic uh, writer i would um so it i i was overall like i i really got into the world i i'm not familiar with the revelation space universe but one good thing about diamond dogs is that like you don't really need any any context to appreciate the story it's, yep. it's a, a fairly standalone story mm-hmm. that, that you can totally get la. so once i got past that style i really got into the with this, I think it, it's kind of a cross between a quest and a heist story, mm-hmm. you know, on, on this on this desolate planet of uh, Golgotha, you know, uh, and on this strange construct, you know, the, yeah. the 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 story kind of develops with an apparent uh, repetition of uh, cycles, uh, yeah. cycles of action, you know, mm-hmm. the solving of puzzles, progress through rooms, and encounter with a difficult problem or particularly debilitating debilitating punishment, you know, yeah. that forces the group to 
go back to their ship and focus on a new strategy before returning again. But it's it's uh it's it's never boring or predictable, mostly because Reynolds manages to infuse it with a, a sense of impending danger mm-hmm. through the sl- subliminal uh, perception of a watching, waiting entity that's lying in ambush for the slightest mistake. Uh, you know, like if you make a slight mistake in calculation, and this uh these are calculations that computers would struggle to to make, right? Let alone a human mind. Mm. Uh the punishments are Brutal, gruesome, macabre, you know, uh, sometimes it ranges from maiming to, to, to death, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the, the individuals here tend, uh, basically are trying to, uh, how do you say, hack their intelligence and, and yeah. humanity. You That's know? basically it. Essentially. Yeah, mm-hmm. by either they're, they're infusing hardware into themselves, making, making their brain more, uh, more computerized, more, more artificial. Or they or they or it's done chemically as well, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a variety like, of bio biomechanical uh, and biomechanical and chemical means to basically enhance themselves like, to mm. to transhuman levels to solve these mathematical puzzles like. uh, and it becomes very disturbing as 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 it goes further, you know. Yeah. The the one thing that I didn't expect from it is that <laughs> I thought it was gonna be a pure hard sci-fi <laughs> thing like, where it focuses. On focuses on the science. Yeah. But it actually has really, really good character work here. Yes. Because the the, the growing obsession shown by the adventurers is shown to be the it, that's the real story. It, the story is about obsession, you know. Mm-hmm. Um it's about people unfazed by the grisly remains, you know, and, and, and all the all the horrible things that have happened to them. And they're so obsessed with everything that they're they're using nanotechnology uh, to increase their brain's computational skills, they're using body mo- mod- body modifications for both protection against the assaults and uh, the increasing difficulty level of uh, the different rooms, you know. And and then the last element is the progressive dehumanization of the characters, yes, uh, mm-hmm. merged with their refusal to um, accept defeat or to or to acknowledge the law of diminishing returns. Uh, um, that gives the story a very kind of bleak flavor that mm-hmm. that uh, remains fascinating uh even though that it's uh, it has a very bitter end uh, like it's a it's a bit it's uh. I, I i i like <laughs> i like bitter endings though, you know yeah 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 uh it, it's a very bleak story about uh, about obsession and i i didn't ex- i didn't think that it was going to be about that mm, a very yeah. very human flaw yeah. I, absolutely absolutely i i think like even with the first time i read through diamond dogs right the twist <clears throat> the twist that comes uh, uh, uh just before the third act Kind of. Um, mm-hmm. Took me by surprise, right? But upon reading it like uh, several other times after that, like it really isn't too far of a stretch, right? Mm-hmm. To to imagine that, and like if for me, Diamond Dogs would make a great kind of like movie or a a, a short kind of mini series, right? Mm-hmm. Like in line with something like Moon, for example, you know. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you kind of enjoy it. I I will say though that um. Diamond Dogs was one of kind of like the first things that Reynolds wrote, oh, wow. uh, and his, um, his writing style changes, uh, not dramatically, but it does change, uh, much later on. Like his very direct form of prose has a very meta poetic mm. feel to it in his longer works, uh, especially mm. when he's tying together all these threads from like multiple stories across um across the world that he's building uh yeah. and um I, I the culmination of that i i feel was um with uh what's the name what is it called with, with the poseidon children uh poseidon's children trilogy right which mm-hmm. came out a couple of years ago um which consists of blue remembered earth on the steel breeze and poseidon's wake uh, which is this amazing kind of like multi-generational family story of of that's tied together with like humanity's spacefaring efforts and the rise of uh, afrofuturism in the world and africa mm-hmm. as the main the dominant technological uh, nation mm-hmm. very very fascinating like it's one of those things that uh with Diamond Dogs as well, just because like I was a fan of Q before I, I stumbled upon Diamond Dogs, I read the premise. I was like, okay, I'm down with this. Um, yeah. even before knowing who Reynolds was, you know, uh, there's something incredibly nerdy about the way that he goes about it, right? The attention to detail, the way that he extrapolates all the science and all of that, and in addition to that, the fact that Diamond Dogs is an amazing Bowie album. Yep. And um, Roland Child, who is one of the one of the um characters in the book itself takes uh his name from a, a robert browning poem yep you know all, all these things uh just kind of add up 
loved and, and make make the geek in me really really happy oh you know? man uh, like the, the the poem mentioned is also uh the, one of the inspirations for the dark tower series by stephen king mm. uh so it's uh it's kind of this cross pollination of influences uh, and recurring motifs across all these different works yeah yeah so i i really really uh love that uh and and just you know these these kind of like cross cross references to to all sorts of um of cultural icons that i love is is it yeah just makes me very happy <laughs> Yeah, 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 man. Like it's it's a very nerdy book. Um, it's not like I, I think maybe if you've read uh Andy Weir, like you mm. know, who wrote the who wrote the Martian. Yeah. Although he has a more like um, he is very very uh descriptive in terms of the science and the logistics and the mechanics of yep. of engineering. You know, uh, it's not like that because like Andy Weir has a very at the end of the day, Andy Weir is a very Joss Whedon kind of writing style, mm-hmm. like in terms of the wit and the humor. Yeah. Uh, this is very different. This is this was more direct than I expected. But there is a certain like, like a- elegance to it, lah. Like once yeah. you once you get wrapped up in it, like after you know you read uh the first twenty or thirty or so pages, you sort of like get into the groove of the style mm-hmm. of what it is, and and the directness is a is a different kind of way to get into your brain. Uh, and and I think it relates particularly to the story as well. Yeah. Like you know. Yeah. yeah. So I I think it it really complements the type of story that he wants to he wants to do. Like. Yeah. So I I I feel like I I do hope that you you do venture out to explore some of the, his other work because mm-hmm. the his writing style shifts pretty subtly, um, yep. depending on the setting of the story itself. Mm. Um. So it, sometimes there are certain stories where you go like way back into the past, and he, his prose kind of relaxes a bit. Uh, is a bit more human, right? Yep. And then there's like some really really foul stuff where we're just basically dealing with like AI versus AI stuff, and like the it becomes really really rigid in terms of this language that he uses. Mm-hmm. So uh, it does change. It it threw me off when I first um, discovered him. I I think at that point in time I was reading a lot of like uh, Latin America literature, so you're like your Marquez, your your Borges, mm-hmm. and things like that. Um and like this was very very stark, uh, yeah. but I enjoyed it nonetheless just because like science. Uh, uh Ren- Reynolds has said in an interview that science is its own poetry, right? Like yeah. without the language of poetry, without like uh you know our metaphors, our similes, and all of that, right? We wouldn't be able to describe scientific, uh, processes, right? Mm-hmm. And he leans into that that sort of um a way of, of of telling stories which i find incredibly fascinating because it's not something that is widely held to be it's not a commonly held thing right yes yeah yeah i i actually appre- i appreciate reynolds's writing style the the very compact very efficient mm. uh writing style more than i would say uh man people are going to take this wrong way because you know like, <laughs> uh then, then Tolkien for example yeah uh and I'm a huge fan of Tolkien I love his work watch all the movies read all the books everything along the way like. yeah. but at the same time when I'm rereading right oh, like that, God. That, that 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 like those three pages describing a tree is really unnecessary <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like like there's beauty in it, you know, in setting the world. I get it, you know, you know, but like sometimes, you know, I, I just want to get like straight into a very compact, very new a very compact story. And and this was it, like Diamond Dogs was a very compact story, told in a very efficient way. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, it it boiled right down straight to the ideas, uh, and the ideas are great. Uh and, and at the end of the day is also like science fiction. More than just the science is what it, what it, what the science says about humanity, lah, which is something that Reynolds doesn't forget here either. And in yeah. and, and and in any of the other works that I've I've read also, because I read the Coy's Days after this mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. So um, yes, a it's a very powerful mystery that is very deep, uh, unforgettable characters, uh, they who make really understandable but quite fucked up decisions, but you get their mentality. So yeah. Uh, it gets into the head of these characters really well, also. Lah. So I mean, very high recommend for this. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, and if you're a fan of the of the cube, like you mentioned, you know the cube films. Yeah. Um, definitely go go read this stuff because it's very similar to the cube. Yeah. So I I just uh, discovered earlier today that um there was actually a stage performance of Diamond Dogs. Mm, I I I had uh, encountered that when I was researching this. Yeah. yeah. Um. Did you find any footage of that? Because like no. I would I would really really love to see how they would do that. Honestly, I think we are due for a new cube. Mm. Um, adaptation, but I mean, there was one. There was supposed to be one a couple of years ago, but that never kind of like never kind of came true. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it just never happened. Yeah. Yeah. So I I haven't really heard anything. I I did hear that um Poseidon's children might be adapted, um into film sometime in the future, or at least mm-hmm. is under negotiation right now with Sony. Oh, wow. uh, okay. or Universal. Well, one of the big boys is interested right now just because of how well it did, um, the, the three books did when they came out. Yep. Uh, so I'm kind of looking forward to that, you know. To, uh, I, I feel like we've had some really, really good sci-fi mm-hmm. uh, for a while now, um, especially on TV. Yes. And like, I would love to see R- Reynolds get represented in that sphere as well. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I mean in recent memory, The Expense is probably one of the best... Uh, Mm. book to book to series adaptations i've seen sci-fi wise lah. uh yeah i mean fantastic stuff man i highly recommend uh alistair reynolds's diamond dogs yep. uh you can actually find it online if you just go search for it or if you want to buy like it's actually collected in a short story collection not short story collection a collection of two novellas diamond yep. dogs and turquoise days mm-hmm. uh that's available uh on amazon and keen and in kinokonia and physical book source and things like that uh, so definitely recommend, and I, I myself will be delving uh, deeper into the Revelation space universe because yep. I enjoy Diamond Dogs a lot, and yeah. I do want to. There are like references here to like other aspects of his mythos mm. that I'm fascinated by. So I wanna, I'm, I'm very complete. <laughs> so I, wanna, I, I want to dig deeper into what certain things mean. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah for sure. So man. yeah, you're, you're right. This is actually a very good gateway drug into into the larger, yeah. uh, larger yeah. world. Uh, on a, okay, so past this, I think like for for people who are listening who are keen to pick up Reynolds, I would say uh, Diamond Dogs is a very good place to start. And if mm-hmm. Diamond Dogs sounds a bit too like itch, a uh, hard itch for you, um, mm-hmm. you can go with Slow Bullet as well. That's also another novella that he wrote that is a lot less daunting, I think, uh, for people yep. who aren't used to hard sci-fi. Yep. Um, but my equally compelling story set in a similar uh, set in the same kind of universe and a very good kind of like gateway <laughs> to to the rest of his stuff. Yes, definitely, man. Uh, go check out all that. Also, um, Un- Unorthodox available on Netflix. Yep. Uh, so it's, I think you should leave with Tim, Tim Ronson. Both of those are Netflix originals. Uh, main topic, Little Women, also available on Netflix. Netflix. So yes. Very easy for you to watch. Uh, as well as his various adaptations out there. And, you know, the book is, go to a library, read something. Uh, <laughs> next, uh, in next episode, in a couple of weeks, we'll be tackling uh, um, a rather uh, pioneering work in gory supernatural ultra violence enemy in Helsing and Helsing Unlimited. Yep. Uh that uh, I'm ultimate, I'm sorry, not unlimited, Helsing Ultimate and Helsing. Uh very uh kind of different. Uh yeah. I think I think Ultimate is, is an improved take on Helsing, but but we'll discuss we'll, yeah, we'll, that we'll delve into that. Uh, I'll be recommending a Hulu miniseries called Normal People, which mm-hmm. is based on a novel by Sally Rooney. And uh, Isa has recommended to me a uh, mighty romantic comedy, uh, Snafu, uh, which <laughs> is an enemy deconstructing the friendship slash rom- rom-com genre yeah. uh, in, in, a very, in a very interesting way. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a way that really got me very emotionally invested to the point where I'm, I'm caught up on all three seasons and uh, I'm waiting for episode uh, 7 to pop up uh, in uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow? So, yeah, yeah it's tomorrow. Yeah, so uh, very very excited to talk about all three topics. Um, till then, this has been Hit Zero. This is Isa. Goodbye, guys. Ciao.